Seterusnya saya meminta Prof Datuk Wan Zulina Wangah Pasal Maritas Fakulti Perubatan UKM untuk memperkenalkan ceramah yang tidak asing lagi kepada kita. Silakan Prof Datuk Wan. Terima kasih uh, Prof Raja Fendi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, pengurus tertinggi uh, universiti dan hospital uh, Prof uh, Datuk Asma Ismail, Dekan Fakulti Perubatan, Kewai Kanan Universiti Dekan Dekan dan uh, hadirin sekaliannya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Uh, syukur Alhamdulillah ya kita dapat bersama pada hari ini kerana meraihkan uh, umur uh, Jubli Mas UKM uh, sempena uh, umur 50 tahun ya. Uh, sedikit saja muda daripada saya tapi tak tak dicakap berapa banyak ya. Uh, saya uh, ingin mengucapkan selamat datang dan terima kasih kerana hadir uh, dan uh, saya ingin memperkenalkan Uh, saya rasa seorang uh, tokoh yang semua orang kenal tapi saya akan baca juga sedikit uh, sebanyak CV beliau ya. Uh, Prof Dato Asma Ismail uh, dan bahasa Inggeris ya. Uh, is a woman, woman of many firsts. Uh, she was the first female vice chancellor of the of University of Science Islam Malaysia to see ya, in 2012 and the first female Vice Chancellor of University of Science Malaysia USM in 2016 to 2019, making her the first woman to be appointed twice as a Vice Chancellor of a public university. Uh, she has served as the country's first female Director General of, Educa of Higher Education in 2014 to 2016, and is currently the first female President of Academy of Sciences Malaysia 2016 to 2022. She also serves as the first female to be chairperson. Uh, seems a bit uh, to you, yeah, but that's uh, Prof. Dato Asma, chairperson of the Malaysian Qualifications Agency from January 2019 to 2021. Her current position is as the as holder of the Ibnu Sina Chair for Medicine at UIAM from the year 2020 to 2022. She also serves as an honorary professor at the Institute for Research in Molecular Medicine (USM) and associate research fellow at the Biotech Research Institute in University of Malaysia Sabah. Uh, her background, educational background, is from uh, she has a BSc in Biology with distinction from University of Nevada, MA in Microbiology from Indiana University, and a PhD in Cellular and Molecular Biology from University of Nevada, Nevada Reno, UNR. Yeah? Uh, Prof. Asma has uh, main interest is in uh, diagnostics and she has patented 14, she has 14 patents to her name and has commercialized the rapid diagnostic test for typhoid, typhoid called Typhidot, uh, which was advocated by WHO. She has published uh, over 131 papers, received more than 213 awards and recognitions and presented more than 425 uh, more than 400 papers including the 300 over 300 invited talks at plenaries and 48 keynotes both at the national and international level uh, she was elected to the academy of sciences malaysia in 2003 the academy of sciences for developing world twice yeah, in 2010 and the islamic world academy of sciences in 2016 she is uh, She was awarded, uh, she was elected as honorary member of Iranian Academy of Medical Sciences in 2017 and the following year as a member of College of Fellows of Kiel University and Governing Advisory Board for Ritsumikan Asia Pacific University in Japan. In her rec in recognition of her leadership of lifelong learning in Commonwealth, especially for women and her outstanding service, to advancement of higher education and science, she was conferred the Honorary Fellow of the Commonwealth of Learning in September 2019, this last year, and Honorary Scholar for Institute for Applied System Analysis, Vienna, Austria, Austria in November 2019. She currently serves as the selection panel for the Medeca Award and wrote scholarship to select Malaysians to Oxford University. In 2020, she was elected to be board member of Commonwealth of Learning based in Vancouver, Canada. Her landmark contributions to Malaysia higher education included 
the establishment of the prestigious National Academic Award, Anugerah Academic Negara, establishment of research universities in Malaysia, and also in co-helming the development and implementation of the Malaysian Education Blueprint for Higher Education in 2013 to 2025. For these and other achievements, she received an honorary Doctor of Science from the University of Glasgow in 2013, Indiana University Thomas Hart Benton Mural Medallion in 2015, honorary degree Doctor of the University, Kiel University, and honorary doctorate in literature from Kyoto University of Foreign Studies in 2017. In 2018, she was awarded the Toko Sri Kandi National Award, academic, and Toko Marido Rosul at the national level in 2019 for her outstanding contribution and being an exemplary figure in the field of higher education, research and innovation, and policy on science and technology locally and abroad. So as you can see, Prodato Asma is well suited to talk about academic leadership. She is the person in, uh, in academia through blue-blooded academic and Please uh, welcome Prof. Dato Asma to deliver her talk. Terima kasih, uh, Dr. Wan, for the kind um, introduction. Uh, sekejap ya, saya kena belajar to uh, share screen. Nampak kah? Yes. Nampak, nampak. Can see? Yeah. Uh oh. Okay, clear. Huh? Okay. Right. Okay. Terima kasih Datuk Wan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera and a very good morning. Uh, good morning. But good afternoon uh, to everyone. And um, hope um, all is well uh, with you and the family. Uh, selamat uh, berpuasa. And uh, to everyone uh, who has uh, joined in, um, thank you very much. Uh, for joining me uh, today to share my thoughts on uh, realizing academic leadership in a teaching hospital post-COVID-19. Uh, and uh, before I proceed, I'd like to um, take this opportunity uh, to thank the UKM medical faculty um, for inviting me um, to give the talk and uh, my special thanks uh, to the Dean Yang Mulia Professor Dr. Raja Afendi Raja Ali and of course uh, my good friend, thank you uh, Yang Bahagia Professor Emeritus uh, Datuk Dr. Wan Zulina Wanna for actually putting all these things together um, to create this um, online conference. And um, before I proceed, um, let me also take this opportunity to wish a happy 50th anniversary yay, to uh, UKM uh, 50 tahun dah. Uh, it was only last year that USM celebrated its 50th anniversary, so time flies. And you are now the third university celebrating the 50th um, anniversary. Dan saya doakan semoga terus maju dan uh, berjaya. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I wanted to talk about academic leadership uh, in a teaching hospital post COVID-19. about I think there's a lot of change that's going to happen and it's best that we discuss what's going to happen uh, post um, uh, COVID-19 so that it become more interesting. But essentially, this is what I'll be covering um, to stay relevant. What can we learn from COVID-19? Because this is what we need to do to move forward. And uh, what is the impact of uh, COVID-19 crisis to medical education? It's something that we need to discuss. And um, of course, what is the academic leadership that is about to be shown in handling medical education during, during the COVID-19? And then none, of course, um, there are also opportunities uh, in uh, medical education at the time of COVID-19 itself. Then whatever that we learn, uh, we have to go forward. There's new things that need to be done, obviously, tentang medical education post-COVID-19. We will also discuss that. And of course, while we are doing all this, where is the teaching hospital in the picture? Uh, also, we need to discuss. And what will be the role of the teaching hospital post-COVID-19? Uh, so this is something that uh, we would like to discuss about. So um, as a form of introduction, let me share, share by saying that um, healthcare professionals uh, whom we teach today will essentially become the professionals of tomorrow, carrying our values, our skills, our hopes and uh, for the profession for the future. And um, whatever 
the students uh, learn today will represent the future of the healthcare system. Um, while Malaysia during our younger days used to be the overperformer in health, we used to be like the best there is, right? But currently our health uh, performance is uh, lagging. And if you ask why, it's because we had done previously, um, had not found a path to adapt Malaysia's changing context. Uh, in what sense? Uh, in the unreformed healthcare delivery, um, non-communicable diseases have been poorly addressed. Public private sector health are separate and fragmented. Um, low prepaid and poor financing, insufficient health investment, high medical price, inflation, decreased value for patients. This I picked up from the talk by the previous Minister of Health while he launched the Malaysia's Digital Healthcare Reform Agenda. And um, uh, EPU had also uh, done the analysis and showed that currently uh, Malaysia's uh, healthcare system is in the laggard phase as far as industry is concerned is in the laggard phase. So amidst the lagging um, healthcare system, we are now faced with the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So if you're going to stay relevant, uh, what can we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic? So that would be the first question. And the first thing is that COVID-19 uh, has provided a very public test, the quality of political leadership. And um, uh, currently, we are still learning about the virus and we don't know how long this journey of learning is going to be. Every time we think we conquer, the virus always has something new to say. And the only certainty is uncertainty. And therefore, change is inevitable um, because the COVID-19 pandemic, whether you like it or not, will force you to address the gaps and force you to address, address the gaps immediately. And is, is it kind of irony that while we are fighting for our teaching hospital to be, um, you know, a state of the art uh, equipment, young know, state of the art, but essentially with COVID-19, it, uh, it takes basic public health principles like testing, contact tracing and isolation to essentially try to bring this uh, COVID-19 um, uh, to an end or at least flatten the curve. So um, if you were to read the literature, there are many, many things. I think in the social media, there's also things that has been sent in, videos that have been sent in untuk menginsafkan kita ya, uh, regarding what COVID-19 pandemic has taught us. But um, I will pick up some of the things that is now relevant in order for us to now uh, move forward with medical education post-COVID-19. First thing, the country... Uh, needs to be self-reliant, okay? The country needs to be self-reliant on what product matters during a pandemic, right? We don't have enough. Uh, we want to do diagnostics. We want to do 16,000 tests a day. We don't have enough of the diagnostic reagent. We have to import the diagnostic reagent. We want to do the test. We don't have enough diagnostic kits uh, available, all right? So basically, there is a need for us to re-examine the existing industries and boost uh, industries that make uh, swap, simple things like swap. Also, we have to wait uh, to get things done. PPE, not enough. Face shields, uh, therapeutics, vaccine, diagnostic agents, all this. Uh, we have to now be able to look at the existing industry, set up this industry. If not, we need to identify companies that can retool. That means we can say, okay, this is a company that is now doing X, Y, Z in the pre-trade zone. Can you now retool to produce the necessary ventilators, PPE, swaps, masks, etc.? And the speed of the response um, also matters. COVID-19 is a test of leadership. The kind of leadership that we want now has got to be effective leadership. This effective leadership means a leader who can pull all the many national resources um, together at the same time to meet a common goal. Like, for example, we now have the MOH, MOSTI, MOHE uh, to do lab testing led by um, Datuk Professor A. Rahman A. Jamal. I never know until today what that A stands for. Uh, but uh, to pull us all together to do lab testing, right? And um, 
And when we talk about during this pandemic uh, and effective leadership, we're not longer talking about gender. Is it wanita better, lucky better? We're no longer talking about gender. We are now and also no longer talking about the needs of the individuals, uh, uh, you know, politically, is he going to make it uh, with the election, coming election or something. But rather now, the leadership is about partnership between the politicians working with the scientists, the public health officials, uh, the private sector, sharing responsibility and decisions made. And this is what I had discussed at the faculty before, uh, tentang concept of participatory leadership where the various team members are all empowered to give opinion and then the government make a consensus decision for the country guided by science, right? And um, we see now countries that deem to have done relatively well, uh, including Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, Denmark, Germany, New Zealand, both have shown effective and decisive leaders. Decisive are leaders who are competent, credible, trustworthy, and the decisions that have been made uh, that, uh, are guided by science and um, evidence-based. Right? And we learn another thing, the social solidarity, that a good health system alone is not enough and that health and social care must be seen in a more integrated manner and that social solidarity is necessary basically to flatten the curve. And uh, the society, masyarakat, essentially is the front line of defense and that people when they come to the hospital is the last defense. All right, so, um, and how do we get people to be together to show social solidarity, to now stay at home, stay safe, stay at home, you know, and not wanting to, uh, for me, challenge uh, the MCO. Um, we find that social engagement on the crisis is very important. And I think Malaysia has done uh, a good job in, in making sure that happening. In fact, you will notice that to lift the MCO, I mean, we're still MCO until uh, June 9, but to lift that, uh, WHO requires that communities are fully educated, engaged and empowered uh, to adjust to new normal if you, the country plan to now lift the MCO. And um, we see civic heroism and shared responsibility. Uh, of course, civic hero heroism among our health and social care workers uh, who make all these extraordinary sacrifices on behalf of all of us. And I think the hospital, UKM, uh, the Pengarah and all the team, I must congratulate all of you for, for actually showing that aspect of civic heroism and to all the other hospitals around the country as well. And not only do we see among the health professionals, we see civic heroism even among bus drivers, uh, food panda, uh, delivery boys and girls, hopefully, shop assistants, um, garbage collectors, and other key workers who continue uh, to basically sacrifice uh, to keep us safe. And all of these people, essentially, what are they showing? They're showing to you shared responsibility uh, of the company uh, on, on their, their sacrifice uh, to be able to now help uh, with uh, combating the virus. And we also see scientists uh, showing shared responsibility by repurposing their labs uh, to do better, to better understand the virus. Um, we see engineers uh, repurpose, uh, repurpose the, their design and production facility to supply the much needed PPE, the face shields and whatnot. Um, we've seen that um, with the engineering team as well throughout the country. And uh, one thing for sure, uh, COVID has taught us that no man is uh, an island and that if you want to go forward, there is an enhanced global collaboration, no longer just local collaboration. There must be also global collaboration, the sharing of knowledge in a global ways to actually develop vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics. This concept of civic spiritedness, yeah, the spirit of shared responsibility and solidarity must be lasting. It's not just about uh, Masa COVID, we show this. I uh, hope that uh, we can extend this beyond uh, COVID-19 crisis. And this essentially, ladies and gentlemen, I have to bring you guys back to the fact that the Malaysian Higher Education Blueprint launched in 2015 Sudah pun bercakap tentang uh, shift one, which is the concept of good citizenry, right? Um, this is what 
higher education. In fact, post-COVID, higher education should play a bigger role in determining uh, how uh, education should be for the future. So uh, shift one have already shown nurturing of learned values-based uh, talent, holistic, uh, entrepreneurial balance, graduate balance between knowledge and character. So if we have that, the halama kita practice and this, then civic heroism will be all natural uh, happening uh, in the country. One thing for sure, government needs to integrate ecosystem and healthcare with the SDGs in mind. Right. So the COVID-19 crisis have shown to the world that uh, we need an integrated ecosystem, not just about maintaining the Ministry of Health, but the Ministry of Health has got to work with the other ministries and that whatever we are doing now, you will have to see how it integrates with the entire ecosystem, the plants, the environment, the animals, the organism, all that with the health and well-being of humans if you want to ensure survival of humanity. And that uh, we've seen many times human activities that uh, basically um, affected um, uh, various uh, ecosystems and have major impacts, uh, sorry, uh, on the occurrence of all these natural disasters. And one case in point is that um, deforestation and the um, illegal wildlife uh, markets uh, will resulted in the proximity um, this illegal wildlife markets and trading, which at the moment, uh, ASM, we check on this, uh, they don't have enough policies that can control this illegal uh, wildlife market. So as a result, you see now proximity between the wildlife and the humans, and that has now made zoonotic-related diseases easily transmitted to human beings. And as such, we see that the spread of COVID-19. And more will come if we don't uh, look into this. So at ASM, we now want to deep dive and look into the roadmap for these zoonotic diseases. Not that we are not teaching about zoonotic diseases in the medical school. I think it's part and parcel of the curriculum. But when we teach, did we connect the dots between what's happening with the ecosystem, uh, the illegal wildlife market and all that that is now causing the spread of zoonotic. So I think pesara pesara masa hadapan kena start to now look into this matter. And COVID-19, um, has already, I think, if you don't learn it by now, we can no longer wait, work in silos, especially between ministries. We can no longer work in silo between the university and the ministry, and we can no longer work in silo between the public and the private sector. So all this, we have to work in partnership, and it's better that we go in into the 17 SDGs so that now at least we can create a balance in the ecosystem. So the pandemic has shown that um, the old way of diagnosing diseases in silo is irrelevant and costly, and we need to work together to perform diagnostic testing. Let me tell you, Ministry of Health, for sure, you will not be able to get 16,000 diagnostic tests to be performed if uh, they don't work together with the Ministry of Higher Education, where universities now start to come in, and we see now universities uh, with research labs in Sabah and Sarawak repurpose the lab to actually now do uh, diagnostics. So this is the coming together. This is the partnership that I'm talking about. So if we all had listened to what COVID-19 has taught us, then the next question would be, what is the impact of COVID-19 crisis to medical education? Now, I think the pengarah of the teaching hospitals, I think you are aware that during a crisis as part of infection control, everybody except for the doctors, the nurses, the relevant support staff, everybody is leaving the teaching hospital. You are under MCO. So the question then is that we ask the student also not to go in. So preventing medical students from practicing and learning medicine during a crisis uh, may be seen as detrimental for the next global health crisis. But kalau dia tak expose sekarang, macam mana dia nak tahu how to handle the global uh, health crisis of the future? And many had written in to say that, hey, hello, this is a missed opportunity for first-hand training uh, during uh, a pandemic. And uh, some people had also written in to argue that, uh, wow, well, this is, after all, ladies and gentlemen, the medical profession. If you are not involved in risk, then why are you in the medical profession? And that, uh, uh, so risk is always there in the medical profession. And uh, we have to believe that we have taught all the necessary precautions, the aseptic techniques, etc., 
uh, how to use the PPE correctly to the students and uh, all the other techniques of infection control to minimize risk. And after all, the students are always there with the HIV, lah, with SARS, lah, with um, upper, uh, TB, which is also infectious. So what's the big deal about COVID-19? Why are we not allowed to come in? So these are some of the questions that have been asked in the internet um, uh, on this matter. So ladies and gentlemen, there is a reason for this. The students are stopped because this is a highly contagious pandemic and that the students may contract the disease or transmit the disease unknowingly because I think ASM fact sheet have shown that at least 76% of people with COVID are actually asymptomatic. So actually you'll be working with the patient and you don't even know you're spreading uh, the COVID-19 to other uh, healthy people as well. So unlike HIV, TB and the other infectious diseases, we also at the moment lack the diagnostic test kits to be able to test all the students, etc. And we lack the PPE to protect the students. So the question is, is it ethical to move the students in? Uh, walaupun missed opportunity, but I think we have to protect uh, uh, the students uh, more on this. So what then will be the short and long-term effect of COVID-19 on medical um, education? Um, uh, overnight, uh, in-person uh, teaching, um, clinical skills, uh, assessments, etc., all now being replaced with online learning. And uh, uh, this is basically challenging uh, medical students, not only challenging, the medical student is also challenging the academic staff because most of us are so used to bedside teaching etc and suddenly now have to do all this chara online uh, this is now uh, new everybody has to be flexible has to be uh, adaptive to the new learning styles and uh, we see now uh, with the mco and the universities closing the students bedside teaching and what rounds uh, replaced now by virtual uh, cases Community engagement, uh, blueprint, shift one, is supposed to be teaching experiential learning so that we teach values-based education is also now stopped due to the MCO. And, um, and, and all this uh, will result in reduced time in the learning and exposure to the essential clinical skills and social skills. That again, is going to be detrimental to the quality of the doctors and the healthcare professionals in the future. And um, I think let us all be frank, um, medical education uh, basically is not designed to be fully online. Uh, and uh, these gaps or pause in uh, 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 clinical uh, uh, skills uh, uh, is something that probably we cannot uh, have for very long. So basically we cannot run away from blended learning. Uh, with medical education to go 100% online, probably not there yet. Uh, there is a need for us uh, to now actually move for blended learning. Although some lectures, uh, the basic science part, uh, first three years, uh, non-clinical, uh, basically can be online, uh, but other parts of the curriculum like team-based learning, patient interviewing skills, physical examination skills, um, and then uh, rapport with the patient, so interview, you know, so learning directly from patient uh, as part and parcel of the healthcare team um, basically cannot be learned. This is part and parcel of experiential learning, cannot be learned via online. And then some people are saying, no worries, um, kita ada technology, uh, we have uh, apa ni, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, that can now be able to now do fantastic things yang dulu kita tak boleh buat sekarang ni simulations can now be done very well so um, use of the technology remember uh, MQA bukan look at the process of teaching but rather the outcome of teaching yeah? that means did the student whatever you do in whatever mode you, 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 you teach the student does it, uh, does it bring about learning I think this is the question uh, we want, want to ask. So that means to say for learning to happen, we still need the ideas and creativity from academics to create content for effective learning via online. 
And let me be frank, huh? I think dekat UKM, Muhammad uh, apa, MB has been doing this zaman Tan Sri Azlan lagi uh, to have this um, apa new moves lah, new ways of online. Uh, kepada the junior ones, uh, you know, they can pick it up. Tetapi for the senior lecturer, oh, ini banyak leceh lah. Uh, so, um, apa, for us now to be able to change and be able to be adaptive to this new online learning. Bukan semua ya, some, some uh, uh, of the seniors are more hebat. Eh? Tapi uh, kebanyakan ya, seniors uh, prefer the old way of teaching uh, and learning. But um, we need to move on. So in a curriculum that is compact and fast-paced as that of medical education, the break that we now see uh, or the pause in the clinical education part, the clinical skill part, uh, may result in a negative uh, long-term um, consequences for our society. But, but, uh, ni nak kena remind balik lah, kalau kita tak take a break from uh, expanding the policies of uh, the blueprint, shift nine, we already in 2015 said that the country needs to go on flexible education using blended learning. Check out shift nine on globalized online learning. Kita dah promise 200 MOOCs, uh, so if uh, to be shared, right? So if at that point in time we have MOOCs from medicine and all that, dah lama kita boleh apa, go in into this flexible education without having to wait uh, for a pandemic uh, to happen. So, uh, what kind of academic leadership uh, do we now want to show uh, in trying to handle medica medical education? during um, uh, COVID-19. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, today is not about leadership in you, okay? Today is about academic leadership. That means how now academics together with the administrators can now bring about change. This is what uh, the topic is today. So, um, uh, extraordinary uh, situations basically need flexible solutions. Um, and this is the time, uh, remember MQA during this COVID pandemic had already passed the buck back to Senate. Senate yang boleh decide sekarang ni uh, in terms of assignments, uh, bila admission, uh, bila exam, uh, academic schedules, etc. So this is now passed back to um, uh, Senate. Uh, yang paling penting, uh, do you achieve the learning, that's what MQA is looking for. So, uh, in response to COVID-19, uh, suggestion, uh, bukan kata must, but suggestion, we can always move all the contents in the basic sciences while the MCO is happening. Why not, if that is happening in Tahun 2, Tahun 3, we can actually shift uh, apa, the contents in the basic science, health system, sciences, etc. And even in behavioral science to online learning. Okay. That, that can also happen. Um, and clinical skills uh, session, uh, we can have it online ataupun via simulation. Simulation learning pun dah terror lah. Uh, or you can also uh, make a decision to defer the practical part, defer it to uh, another date uh, in the later part of the year maybe. Uh, in the meantime, the students are asked to uh, learn via virtual um, resources. Um, and assessment uh, can also be done via online. Uh, for me, and uh, open book exams can also be done. Basically, there's also no stopping you to consolidate and modify the academic calendar uh, to allow for later entry into the clinical environment. So that is also another thing that can be done. But uh, post MCO, katalah after uh, June 9, ni, there is now the uplifting of the MCO. So uh, the students will now come back, but to come back in a different environment. Um, they can still have the small group interaction, the lab session, the simulation, the bedside teaching, etc. But this time, I think we need to emphasize on um, uh, practicing physical distancing, the wearing of masks and proper infection control procedures. So the question is, what happened to the student ni, final year sekarang ni, yang supposed to graduate? What will happen to them? They, apa, their punya clinical session is not there. They cannot do very much on this. So, are they, apa, kekurangan lah, uh, dari segi exposure time. 
So one, uh, the Chinese experience I was reading uh, in China, bila the students had to uh, graduate tanpa enough exposure for clinical, which they think not enough. So one way to overcome uh, is to um, ensure continuous training of the critical care physician doctors, but they give certification. So there is this uh, group of doctors, young graduates sekarang without uh, quote unquote sufficient exposure uh, for clinical, dimestikan uh, di China untuk uh, ambil this continuous training uh, whenever the MCO is uh, lifted. So that's another um, idea for the, saya rasa dalam, dalam uh, apa, uh, talk ni mungkin ada members of the apa, deans of the medical council. So mungkin some of the ideas um, we can uh, look into. Tak semuanya uh, very bad. There is also opportunities. So for every uh, thing that happen, insyaAllah ada hikmahnya. So what about the opportunities for medical student education during the time of COVID itself? Okay, because this is the time that we test even ourselves. You know, we we don't say to the student, okay, now you want to go online learning, and and they now have to be flexible, adaptable to this online learning. Staff juga kena tunjuk flexibility and adaptability attributes that is now needed for medical practice in order to um, stay relevant. Um, many uh, students, especially uh, around the world, medical students around the world, and I'm sure in Malaysia as well, um, upper, many are volunteering at the call centers. Um, some are creating the patient education materials, some are helping with the grocery shopping, some distributing food to those uh, in need. Uh, some of the students are working in the nursery for health, you know, healthcare workers. Uh, they have to be working there. Uh, for COVID, they want pun ada family, anak-anak mereka mana nak letak. So, that is, apa, hospital memang, at least in HUSM, they memang buka a nursery for the healthcare workers on duty. So, this is where also uh, people can come in to uh, be able to uh, help jaga anak-anak while the mom and dad are facing uh, the, the crisis. And of course, some students are involved in the making and distribution of the sanitizers. I know apa, pharmacy schools, uh, are doing that. Uh, some are making the PPE. Um, majority of the engineering uh, using the 3D laser printer that they have, uh, they're making face shields. Uh, I know the UTEM, USM, uh, I'm sure UKM as well, UM, they're all doing all this, right? Um, but while we're doing this, we are adhering to physical distancing. So if the students are doing all that, why can't we be creative and say, hey, they, they are doing this uh, 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 this volunteering is part and parcel of uh, learning the balance between knowledge and character. So they have the knowledge, the engineering group, they have the knowledge, the medical group, they have the knowledge, and they're doing, turning this knowledge into helping people. So why can't we this, do this as part of assessment of character and values, which is uh, usually the concept of ICGPA, this is what we need to be able to um, give marks for. Um, and one area that the students uh, can uh, serve um, and have a positive uh, effect um, is to become educators to their peers, the patient, uh, community as part and parcel of social community engagement while practicing physical distancing. So this is something that they can now do because, you know, term 4, term 5, takkanlah tak boleh uh, 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 educate uh, the people. Um, you see, use the tools available. Uh, they are very good in social media. They can use the tools available and uh, other modalities to help influence the behaviors in a positive way. Uh, like, uh, for example, during this time, ASM, we created the ASM fact sheet because there are so many things available. Sampai masyarakat benda tak tahu which one is fake news, which one is the real thing. So this is something that uh, ASM had done to create a fact sheet. Uh, and this fact sheet is written uh, in simple signs uh, way, simple way to guide the public to understand the science behind COVID-19. I mean, this is ASM Chara. And we found that if we had written this in English, there will not be much sharing. But when we write it in Bahasa and uh, a lot of people were tweeting on it. And so there's still a lot of things that need to be communicated in Bahasa. So, um, but uh, when we do this uh, fact sheet, uh, uh, inter-academy panel is able to 
uh, pick it up and then spreads uh, globally. So you see simple things like this that we do uh, every two weeks uh, suddenly now gets to go global. So the students can do something like this as well. Um, and, um, you know, uh, why can't we use this as part of their continuous assessment? Uh, the things that they could have done or have done uh, and Chava social media, maybe that can be part of their continuous assessment as well. So perhaps the medical school, uh, this is the time lah, uh, Bani, to share best practices uh, as to how they are handling the experiential learning part. I rasa the, even the online learning, uh, this is the time. I mean, you know, via Zoom, uh, I may not come from UKM. Now I can see over 300 people are already uh, listening. In a conference, you have to wait for like 150 or 200, but by using Zoom uh, and YouTube and Facebook Live, I mean, so many people, not just in Malaysia, but around the world can actually now be assessing to what I have to say. So um, this, this is a new concept, and this is a new concept that I think need to be uh, uh, continue uh, post-COVID-19. So this is also a time for medical dean um, uh, council to set up advancements in medical curricular innovation and creativity. So, uh, banyak challenge for the medical dean's uh, council. So, after listening to all that, um, what will be now uh, medical education post uh, COVID nineteen, right? So, and if they and of course the question is what is going to be different this time around? I mean. Uh, you have learned through all that, so what's going to be different? So this is something that we need to address, uh, face up and uh, face on. And um, one thing, uh, which is my mantra for every talk that I give, uh, you know, you need to become lifelong learners. COVID-19 has thought that if you think you're good enough, oh, there are many things more that you have to learn. So we are now lifelong learners and, this, uh, and we have to be able to respond to change. Uh, and fast respond to change. And therefore, there's a lot of learn, unlearn, relearn, co-learn from each other. And when we co-learn, this is where we co-create stuff. And this is where we now say, why not the medical schools in the country, right? The, uh, yang daripada IPTA, yang daripada IPTS, so many, more than 30 together, you know, why not you co-create uh, online learning such that it can be shared uh, by all, right? So um, if we now, uh, if the Dean's Council now and the academic staff now say, okay, let's address the medical curriculum of the future, you need now to address the shifts that we are seeing in healthcare itself. Because and healthcare is also shifting to sustainable health. It's no longer just about healthcare, it's about the wealth, wellness paradigm, which is sustainable health. And this is now in line with the SDG and the shared uh, prosperity vision. Remember, now everything we do now is going to match the shared prosperity vision of Malaysia. Um, and we have to now move to community or social engagement as opposed to just having the people to come to the hospital, uh, right? Because now the emphasis is on prevention. The emphasis is no longer on treatment. Jadi, uh, saya tak sempat masa VC, tapi uh, mungkin sekarang VC baru UKM boleh buat KPI kepada pengaruh hospital. Kalau dapat lebih banyak pesakit masuk ke hospital, mana KPI dia menurun sebab dia patut lebih kurang uh, the number of patients in the hospital. So I mean, if this concept was done, because a lot of us are just waiting in the hospital for people to come in rather than wanting to go out and spread the social engagement via community engagement, spread the uh, what are the health uh, issues uh, that need for the community to be addressed and make them understand. And it's also important uh, because a community that understand, a community that has been engaged uh, will all, always ensure uh, solidarity uh, when we face future pandemic or crisis. And we don't want to be in a situation that what we see now in the United States. Um, and we are moving now to integrated system healthcare. Uh, rather than just taking care of health by one ministry alone. So that's it. The healthcare, as we see now, is no longer alone. It has to be integrated with the ecosystem and the civil society. 
The next thing, the shift that um, uh, we um, also see is the need to move to value. And we should always aim to give the best value to the uh, population. Um, and then, of course, maybe uh, uh, you can put this as part of a common curriculum that uh, the importance of the teaching of public health policy, um, health economics, and simple public health measures, they all need to be there. And one thing for sure uh, that is highlighted uh, uh, during uh, COVID, the skills in procurement, you know, to get diagnostic, to get the reagent, to get all these things need to be done fast without AP59. Can this be done? What can you now do? All these skills in procurement from the administration, this also need to be facilitated. Yeah? And learn, can facilitate it, yeah, learn. Yeah? Um, and um, if you now talk about training of the future ready doctors and professionals, um, definitely we have to train effective leadership. That means leadership that is not dictatorial, but participatory. That means listen to many parties before they make decision. Leadership that is a team player and leadership that makes informed, decisive decision guided by science and evidence base, right? So um, the other thing very important, machines are coming in, robots are coming in, and whether you like it or not, robotics is here to stay as part and parcel of the uh, medical uh, uh, scenario. So now what cannot replace the machines are the soft skills. These are the bedside manner, the good attitudes and attributes, the care, the compassion, the empathy, that people look for that machines cannot give. This now becomes more important. And perhaps this is what you need to emphasize and that uh, maybe you should just cut back on the just-in-case knowledge because Professor Google is very fast. It can answer many questions to the student very, very fast. Tak payahlah Professor Tasma nak answer. Biar Professor Google saja answer the just-in-case knowledge. What we need to do is this experiential learning that need to be built in, into the students and trained. Right? And the students uh, need to have an underlying sense of responsibility towards the community and the patients with strong sense of values and ethos that we need to see. Another thing also, clinical practice expect the change because uh, as we move towards an engaged and informed society, tak boleh banyak chong dah kepada patient. Eh? Uh, so many patients now are very well informed. Uh, they are bringing in medical medical reports and lab tests and then um, they now ask the doctor, can you please interpret uh, this test? So expectations are high that the doctors know how to interpret all these various lab tests, etc. So that brings me to case in point that um, soft skills, good bedside manner, good attributes, good attitudes. Perhaps also to relook at the how we select for medical students um, during the interview. Selalunya kita cari 4.0, uh, makhluk, makhluk 4.0, of course, uh, they are the ones that need to come in. 5A lagi, all right, to come in. Um, and um, maybe with the future way of medical education, uh, perhaps we should put a little bit less weightage to the exam result, but masa interview, cungkil dia punya communication skill, dia punya behavior pattern, dia punya attitude, dia punya attribute, dia punya care, empathy, compassion. Does the student show independent thinking because you have to react, you have to act fast during a crisis. Uh, is the student a problem solver and is the student a team player? So these are some of the questions that uh, we would like now to see as part and parcel of this training. Of course, we say, um, as we uh, post-COVID-19, then there is the new word in town called the new normal, right? So, um, and that, um, is it new norms? Uh, maybe uh, apa, teaching online using Zoom and having meetings in Zoom is probably a new norm. Uh, but um, these are the things that the blueprint and uh, apa, that has been uh, taught to the people since 2015, so the question, I think Tan Sri Zhu raised the question, are we talking about renewed normal? That means these are the things we're supposed to do, but we never do. Uh, now we have to do, and suddenly now it becomes a new norm. So, adakah apa yang kita dah buat dulu? Salah, to the point that sekarang semua kena jadi new norm. I don't think so. 
uh, what we are doing is there. It's just that mungkin emphasis yang kita bagi kepada online learning uh, is less. So now nampaknya the emphasis need now to be balanced in order to do this. So I sort of uh, think is this a new norm or is it should be a renewed norm uh, as Tan Sri Zul uh, apa, um, had mentioned before in his talk. Um, post COVID uh, 19, we will see a more widely shared understanding that digital tools are only complement, they are not substitute to teaching because the intimacy and immediacy of face to face learning is still very important. As mentioned in the blueprint, the way forward is, and also around the world, Skarani, they are saying moving forward is blended learning, and uh, some courses uh, can be placed online. And the students, when we uh, when we would read the blueprint, we did the surveys, and the students are saying, for God's sake, can we just use the time in the classroom to have discussion, to have the time to connect the dots, the time to have uh, debate and guided practice, uh, rather than just teaching saja menggunakan PowerPoint. So, point from the student, maybe now, academic kena dengar uh, with this concept. So, but uh, one thing that COVID-19 has, uh, COVID has taught us that it is a mistake to outsource core educational capability. Sebab sekarang ni bila kita tidak ada orang yang berkehendak atau mahu tukar to now do uh, uh, interactive teaching via online, we just buy the virtual materials, etc. Um, you, I don't think this is the way to go forward. There is a need now to make sure we have core capability that's why I think we created the Center for Academic Development uh, so that now apa, the academics now learn uh, to do now online teaching in a more um, interactive manner that can create learning. Mananya innovative lah. And, and um, many of the academic now have to be retooled and retrained on content development and design uh, for online learning. So as we look at the blueprint, we had studied uh, a lot before coming up the blueprint for shift nine before 100% uh, uh, for Malaysia at least 100% global uh, uh, online learning uh, is not advocated. Uh, we advocate uh, uh, blended learning up to 70% can be online. The rest still needs a uh, face-to-face uh, discussion. So, um, and in the future, I think we all not uh, let me be frank, lah. the airline industry is not going to be able to uh, ramp up in the next uh, two or three years. And the number of international students, uh, sebab sekarang university uh, has to generate income and you can bet that the number of international students that we depend on the income, not just for the uh, IPTA but also IPTS, uh, international students will not be coming and uh, you are not going to see the kind of numbers that you saw before. And therefore, now this is the time for change, right? And so every VC, president, dean of medical school, probably uh, of pharmacy school, of all the upper uh, allied health, etc., will now, um, and dental school probably will uh, need to understand that online learning now becomes a potential source for new revenue. Because with online learning, um, we now see uh, that the future of universities is that people now subscribe to university rather than enroll to university. Uh, you faham the concept? Subscribe, me macam I subscribe Netflix. There's a whole lot of movies inside there. I can choose which one and I just pay a subscription fee. Same thing, in the university, there's a whole lot of knowledge. People now in the future of higher education subscribe to University UKM. Uh, and then subscribe to USM or to UM or to TM or UTM, subscribe uh, to this. And then all the knowledge that they want is now there and then they pay another extra fee to now get us up the degree. So it's no longer about enrolling. So these are the future thoughts uh, that need to be there. And um, online education, whether you like it or not, will be recognized as core to every school's plan for institutional resilience and academic continuity. Uh, berat tu, uh, Prof. Raja Afendi. So this is the time now all the people now have got to come together and learn about uh, online learning. And post-pandemic, uh, universities all need to have part of their strategic plan for income generation, how to manage and how to fund online education. All right? and, um, and if you need this to happen, it may even affect uh, academic promotions uh, uh, on that matter instead of publication. 
how many online have you done and the impact of your work is now measured by how many people now subscribe every time you give a talk etc etc because this may be more meaningful and more impactful uh, and how many global students did you get uh, to come in and learn from you i think this will be the new kind of measurements of impact for the future um, and uh, selalunya dalam universiti mesti ada lah 10% or 20% yang hebat buat perkara ni. The rest of us uh, don't know, don't care and don't want to get involved. But uh, now, uh, if we the universities need to go forward, then online learning will be there. So management of online learning will now be centralized and probably integrated into the existing academic leadership structures and uh, processes. And tomorrow we will now begin to see a greater emphasis on STI to now provide solution where we are going now for, as I said, wellness paradigm. We are going now to wearables, the one that I have now, to now go from wearables to implantations that you can see there uh, in the picture. And wearables now, the data obtained is stored in the handphone, but the, tomorrow this will now be stored in a big data repository. And this will now be able, uh, because you want to analyze your own personalized analytics for your own health. You don't want to be hearing what the generic health is all about. So with my lifestyle, my way of doing things, how can I move to lose weight? You know? So this is a personalized, as we start to move to personalized medicine. So uh, we are going to go for big data. MIMOS is the, uh, the, the repository for big data from the universities, uh, uh, hospitals, and uh, from, the, uh, from the, all the hospitals. So big data analytics uh, when performed uh, will now be used to detect for disease patterns and potential epidemic or pandemic. And uh, for sure, digital platform is going to be more powerful. This is so convenient. I don't have to fly to KL and you don't have to pay for hotel accommodation and you don't have to wait Meetings so upper conference start on time, 2.30 means 2.30, people will come in whenever they want to come in. And you now see a digital platform like Zoom, uh, founded in 2011, is now worth more than all the US airlines put together. This is how much Zoom has expanded. So by doing this and the fact that the e-commerce now will be the new way of, uh, upper, of uh, shopping, so the internet connectivity, the country has cannot afford this digital divide anymore. It has to now uh, move for internet connectivity so that we can enhance support to personalized medicine, telehealth, and of course, to e-commerce. And of course, genetics and genomics um, and all the biotech techniques, uh, including gene editing, uh, will set a frightening yet fascinating future. So we are already seeing this editing of humanity that is happening with CRISPR. And as we move to the aging, uh, you know, you need the robots now to help with the aging. Uh, we uh, at MIT uh, already uh, is teaching robots uh, right from wrong. Huh? They are actually using artificial intelligence. Bukan nak ajak kita what is right and what is wrong, tapi nak ajak the robots now what is right and what is wrong. And uh, this is something that we are seeing in the future. But one thing that we need to see, kalau kita kata uh, the end game for this COVID, we are all looking forward for the vaccine. Right. Um, so now we find that at least uh, Gavi, uh, which is a part and parcel of WHO, is now saying that 89 vaccines are now uh, being developed against COVID-19. But unless this vaccine, uh, everyone gets this vaccine, then we will not be able to curb uh, the virus. Uh, we have seen previous vaccine, uh, they're all expensive and only the rich gets access to that vaccine. The poor um, uh, is not made... Uh, uh, cannot afford to get the vaccine. So this have got to change because, ladies and gentlemen, an outbreak anywhere is a risk everywhere. So this COVID has now taught us that. So vaccines or therapeutics when made must be made available, accessible, affordable uh, to the people. And, um, and the trend is that uh, if there's going to be a vaccine or therapeutic being made, it will likely be made by the private pharmaceutical or companies or the disruptive biotech startup that is having venture cap to do it, probably not from the government. But the government and the philanthropic funders are needed to ensure that the vaccine is made accessible uh, to all. Um, but one thing for sure, COVID-19, uh, we are seeing a global scientific collaboration like Malaysia, UM is involved, uh, Ministry of Health is involved in part and parcel of the therapeutic 
uh, clinical trial, global therapeutic clinical trial. We have to work together. Many things are tested. Different countries are testing different uh, drugs so that we now know which is the best one to use because we cannot afford one drug at a time to be tested. So this global scientific cooperation shared global efforts to find and develop diagnostics, vaccine and therapeutics probably is the way to go. So as we are talking about medical education, Pangaro Hospital is now saying like, where is the teaching hospital in the picture? Right. Um, the teaching hospital um, is the laboratory for the training of healthcare professionals. So, but to kalau kita health campus, uh, you have the allied health, you have the dentistry, you have the pharmacy, you have uh, the medical. All will come to this one place called the teaching hospital. This is the place where you have now the laboratory for all the training of healthcare professionals, both the undergraduate, postgraduate, medical officers, etc., for all disciplines of health. And a teaching hospital, lain daripada um, uh, general hospital, is set up by the university under the University College Act of 1971. This is a laboratory for the training of healthcare professionals. But to train the, the UGPG, we need to do clinical assessment, etc. So we need patients. So to get patients for clinical training and uh, assessment, uh, it will offer services of a referral hospital, the kind of general hospital, but rather a referral hospital. Atas dasar tu, the statute says that it must be now equipped with a state-of-the-art services and uh, facilities. Being a teaching hospital is not just a service, it must facilitate R&D services. It must facilitate academy, it must facilitate R&D activities with the aim of becoming a center for medical education with international reputation. Bukan setakat hebat di Malaysia, tetapi of international reputation. Uh, kita ada tiga main teaching hospital uh, sekarang ni. Uh, saya tak mention lagi UPM or whatever, but Kita ada three main one, USM, UM dengan uh, UKM, right? UM berlain ya, uh, UM has its own, the, the UMMC ada dia punya own uh, statute, uh, dia ada dia punya own board uh, which is not chaired by the VC. The board of UMMC will decide what UMMC will do uh, and the post also not cross, you tak boleh ambil post of UM to letakkan di dalam uh, post of UMMC. So UMMC have to have them your own post. But USM dengan UKM, kita uh, brothers and sisters. So we have a board that is chaired by the VC. So um, maka the teaching hospital um, now now has been given them your own post and consultants and medical officers and support staff. So basically um, uh, the medical school can loan ataupun transfer some staff to be now permanent, uh, they pegang post of the teaching hospital uh, ataupun seconded uh, apa, for X number of years while they are dilantik sebagai timbalan pengarah ke, pengarah ke ataupun sebagai consultant uh, in in that post uh, on road to the teaching hospital. So that can be done. And remember the teaching hospital uh, has also the private wing so to generate the income. All right, so um, and with the exception of UM, but for USM dengan UKM, because the chair is the vice chancellor, the money generated can be used by the university, but ampun, no way pengarah hospital akan lepas that money. Betul tak? Ha -ha. So all that money, if generated, uh, will now be used to upgrade the teaching hospital and also pay for the salary of the staff in case tak cukup. But this is what is needed to keep the hospital to be uh, state of the art uh, facilities and uh, services uh, and also to be able to have enough money to train, uh, send people for training to get the latest technology etc. So what happens now to the teaching hospital post-COVID-19? Uh, Post-COVID-19, the teaching hospital and hotel summer, yeah? Um, you face a very daunting task, which is to establish trust back in the public. Remember, when uh, during the COVID, all the COVID cases are coming to the hospital, and of course, this is an airborne thingy, and of course, now when people want to come in, so more to pick up, OMG, am I going to be safe coming in into the hospital now? So, some more juga, OMG, am I going to be safe, you know, going to a hotel now, right? Um, so, you need, there is a need now, 
to uh, re-establish trust with the public and because um, hospitals uh, apa, now uh, will shift from healthcare that is safe to now a safe place that provides healthcare. Uh, I think pengarah-pengarah faham tak eh? So this is now the new uh, mindset change that this is a safe place people come on into the hospital because we are a safe place that now provides healthcare to you. So the question then is uh, how do you assure public that the teaching hospital is safe? Safe for student ni nak masuk ni. Safe for student bila MCO is uplifted, bila the university starts to now uh, bring in the admission. So how do you ensure to the public, you know, that is now coming in that the teaching hospital is safe? Number one is the safety of your employees first. I mean, that is a need now for have your employees to go through the masking, the uh, universal precautions of the cleaning protocols, um, uh, incident command center uh, need to be there. Sama juga macam floods, uh, uh, disasters. We have this uh, command center. There's also a need for now a constant command center so that anytime any break happen you know what to do and with thinking people uh, involved in the command center uh, universal precautions and training for all workers jangan kata the nurses the doctors the students semua orang sama juga macam apa fire safety drill eh? semua orang have to be trained termasuk pencuci lah all those people because the cleaning protocols are done by what attendant semua kena be informed i think when we get an engaged population working in the hospital and then there's no break in it. That means kalau kita ada hire orang baru, semua kena go through this training and retraining needs to be done. So all these screening protocols, how you're doing things, all this must be informed to the public. You've got to communicate your commitment to safe environment for the customers, uh, the staff, etc. And so uh, welcome to Hospital UKM. Uh, the, you know, you would lay down the details of how you clean this. This hospital knee, this is knee, we have sprayed the room with this, etc. We want you to have a safe place while you stay in hospital you can. So something like this I uh, need to do and consider making cleanliness as part of your identity and make it very visible. But while you're doing all that, physical distancing is still necessary because uh, waiting room, ah, masa clinic, there's going to be a crowded. So how do you now make sure uh, social or physical distancing is now happening? So this needs to be looked into and um, of course, because this is airborne, look at the air filtration, aerosol transmission, uh, look into the negative air pressure room. And of course, if in the future we have this antigen test uh, available or antibody testing that will now indicate um, whether a good one eh, that will indicate whether you had had exposure, etc., to keep a record of all these individuals. So there's a lot more on this. Uh, so if you type kat bawah ni, what hotels must learn from hospitals for the new reality of tourism by World Economic Forum, you type this, you can get more detail uh, on how to keep the public um, and teaching hospitals safe. So um, uh, with that, uh, I end by saying that uh, beating COVID. 19 takes all of us and to those who go into the storm every day we say we salute you and we say thank you and uh, i would like to say happy uh, 50th um, anniversary to uh, ukm and kepada semua muslim selamat hari raya adil fitri maaf zahir batin stay safe stay at home so terima kasih assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Kasih, uh, Prof. Dato Asma. Thank you so much for a very interesting and uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, I actually under question and answer under Q and A. There's only two questions. Uh, oh, Alhamdulillah. Boleh habis awal lah. Dua soalan. Yeah, but I think a few there were a few hands that were put up, so I think maybe they want to do that uh, orally. They want to uh, say out the question. So uh, I I'll, I think we are here. We start with the uh, uh, written question first, and then uh, we uh, the Cik Buhari can unmute uh, Dr. Nolaili, I think. Nolaili raised her hand. Okay, so the first question, uh, Prof. Asma, yeah. is uh, I think partly answered by your presentation, but I will just read it anyway. It's from Sobana Nai. Uh, she is asking, in your opinion, what is the key role that medical students can play during this pandemic and lockdown? I think I've already answered that. A little bit, yes, you have. Uh, 
they, they apa, medical student volunteer. yeah medical student volunteer, that would be a sad thing lah kan because you are supposed to have all these good attributes so takkan nak duduk kat rumah aja so tempat-tempat yang memerlukan help uh, this is a time that uh, you need to now volunteer uh, distribute the food distribute the PPE distribute the apa ni and uh, help to create maybe uh, materials to apa help educate people in your kampung uh, or in your in your dorm or in your I'm sorry in your flat kalau you kat rumah dan sebagainya so there's a lot of things that uh, that can be done Okay, uh, second question is, uh, actually, uh, not quite sure if it's uh, anonymous, but it says, Dato, we teach students through rural community involvement, uh, which cannot be replaced by any module or AI. Okay. Uh, what uh, does ASM advise in terms of an extension of the uh, semester, at least to get students trained on real ground with health districts and health clinics staff? Okay. Saya dah kata, benda ni dah back to Senate. Uh, MQA dah letak balik back to Senate. Senate can make a decision. This is where sekarang ni, mungkin the Dean's Council ataupun uh, Senate of UKM uh, proposed by uh, Professor Dr. Raja sendiri uh, can now uh, decide, um, defer ke uh, this? Uh, sebab memang tak boleh replace. Saya dah kata, it has to go by uh, blended uh, learning uh, now. So, there are certain things um, Okay, let me be frank, ah, Dr. Raja. They are now like Georgia Institute of Technology. Ah, they pun memang ah, dekat US ni, they are so gangho about ah, now. They pun faham. Ah, there are certain things ah, yang um, ah, perlu experiential learning cannot be replaced. But they're coming up with technologies ah, for learning ah, that now ah, we belum ada lagi lah. Tapi they are now... R&D dia orang is to do that so that uh, apa bila berlaku uh, pandemic uh, there is no deferment uh, ataupun uh, apa uh, tentang exponential learning exponential learning will continue to happen so um, we don't know yet what are the technologies tapi dah memang ada R&D in this aspect but for now for now uh, apa you know some IPTS medical school memang dah mengajar secara simulation Uh, tapi itu untuk clinical skill tapi saya rasa untuk uh, uh, community engagement uh, untuk learn uh, learn values based um, uh, that we need to train to the medical student saya rasa uh, this is the time uh, that uh, the dean council kena decide sama ada as a whole you all differ perkara ni jangan kata satu mesti buat satu mesti tak buat and then kan dari perak peranda uh, Come, come. This is a time for participatory lah. I mean, why we have a Dean's Council to now come up with a proposal on the time how this is going to be done? It's serious uh, uh, issues uh, because saya rasa kalau mereka uh, tak dapat this kind of training, saya rasa macam mereka tak lengkap lah uh, when we graduatkan mereka uh, bulan Mei ni atau Jun ni. Uh, so, it's worth to, for you guys to look into this. How are we going to do this? Okay, I uh, just wondered whether, uh, you know, thinking back about avatar, kan? Avatar. Ah, avatar, yeah. Avatar, yeah. Maybe that sort of, uh, you know, uh, virtual where you can go actually, since like you're experiencing a rural community posting. Yeah. It's all, it's all on the, on the, what do you call? On the, uh, using virtual reality. Yeah. Virtual reality. Yeah. But it's still not the same as the, not the same, sure, yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 you know sometimes it is the experience, you know. Let let me share with you, kan? How when I develop uh, Typhi Dot, so when I develop Typhi Dot, uh, it never occurred to me because kat Malaysia, or budak yang da, uh, the youngest uh, dapat typhoid will be uh, now uh, apa uh, yang pergi ke sekolah, standard six, standard four, standard five. I went to Indonesia. And 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 I found that the typhi dot is positive for babies, and I'm saying, eh, hey, macam mana typhi dot jadi positive for babies? Because the in Indonesia, the mothers are so uh, malnourished uh, that they had to use their water, and they uh, they pun tak ada susu, so badan dah tak hasilkan susu, so they lenyek pisang dengan contaminated water, yeah. and uh, and that is now how then they feed it to the babies, and that yeah. that how now they dapat typhoid. So, so maknanya, 
you need this kind of uh, yes. experiential learning that yes. when I come back to the lab, I now see things differently. And this now um, will make a difference in new discoveries and, and new way, new procedures of uh, handling um, even for medicine. So, saya rasa um, you need the experiential learning. You tak boleh dengan cara, I mean, virtual reality boleh lah, sekejap-sekejap. Tapi tak boleh lah kata it will replace. Totally. Replace, no. no. Uh, too much uh, watch uh, this yeah. movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Laili? No, Laili, can you, are you, uh, can you speak now? No, Laili? No, Laili Tohid? Tak ada. Cik Barik, have you uh, unmute the uh, participants who raise their hands? Uh, Datuk Wan, ha. Prof Nur Laini dah tulis dia punya soalan. Oh, dah tulis lah. Tadi nak, saya... Nak saya bacakan ke? Saya boleh bacakan? Nak, saya boleh nampak, saya nampak. Nampak, okay. Uh, oh, yang ya, bawah ni. Tak ada, dia ada anonymous ya? Uh, dekat so, chat, dekat chat Prof. Oh, dia tulis dekat chat, bukan dekat Twitter. Uh. Haa. Uh. Okay. Um, City, how to enhance teaching in primary care community if teaching hospitals are more focused to sub-specialization services? services. Yeah. How to enhance teaching in primary care or community if the teaching hospitals are more focused to sub-specialization services? <laughs> <laughs> oh, saya nak kata Basically kan Kalau kita tengok statute ke apa ke Tak ada cara-cara kita Mengendalikan hospital ni tak ada Statute very clear This is a teaching hospital yang kena Move academic research uh, apa Moving now as, as I said tomorrow is a moving now To sustainable health You got to go to the community. You got to do all these things, right? So it's a matter of uh, sekarang ni siapa yang nak kena buat? Is it the hospital yang kena buat? Atau the dean of the medical school and the dean of the health and the dean of the dental yang kena sekarang ni make all these things happen. Uh, so, but saya rasa this is the time tak boleh silo dah kot. <laughs> uh, COVID-19 dah kata, no silo man. We have to work in partnership. Uh, jangan nak kata global ni dalam rumah ni. Dan antara... Uh, kita faculty dengan dengan uh, hospital antara uh, teaching teaching hospital when we form the consortium so this this is a time for us to work together so if that's why I tak mau jadi specific I dah cakap the future is moving from healthcare which is treating in the hospital to now sustainable health so kita semua orang intelligent kan kita faham so therefore now we need to go out there and not just wait for the um, community to come. Sebab tu saya seluruh tadi, saya cakap mungkin uh, kalau saya jadi VC, saya letak sebagai KPI kepada pengarah hospital. Uh, bukan how much money dia generate, tetapi uh, how much money penting, uh, tapi at the same time juga um, how many uh, apa, people outside the hospital that we maintain. Uh, that the number kalau dapat decrease means that the hospital is functioning well in that community. So it's a anjakkan paradigma sikit in terms of how we do the KPI. Yeah, I think that also partly answers another question related, a related question, how best a teaching hospital can connect to the medical faculty? <laughs> <laughs> Is that, have you got anything else to add? Not why you got. I'm not working in silos. Yeah, no, no. It is, I think semua ni we are talking now, as I said, about effective leadership, right? Okay. Uh, of apa ni, uh, now working together in form of a partnership. I tak boleh hidup tanpa you, you tak boleh hidup tanpa I. So, kalau kalau kita uh, uh, macam tu, uh, senang sikit lah. Semua tu is about rapport, is about the leader yang pegang at the schools and the leader yang pegang dekat hospital. So, what kind of mindset change uh, do you want to have? Kalau macam saya cakap ni tadi, uh, Piramli kata gumbira punya uh, environment, we have no problem because the hospital, as I said, dalam statute, dia kena facilitate. Uh, so, facilitate tu makna apa? Memang kena ada academic, kena ada uh, R&D, kena uh, move for sustainable health and to become of international repute. So, how are you going to become of international repute? Kalau tak with the help of the schools and the help publish and dalam tu kata clinical trials are being done, these are being done. That's what move the hospital to be of international repute or new 
procedures, new apa um, uh, areas yang dibuka uh, sekarang ni untuk diterokai. So these are the things that make a teaching hospital uh, 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 something yang apa orang akan kata ya kalau macam kat Kelantan lah kalau kat Kelantan ni uh, uh, apa kalau nak cari menantu menantu kat mana dekat dekat HUSM dia tak kata pun medical school sorry ya uh, dia, dia tak kata pun medical school mesti daripada HUSM ah uh, tu ya HUSM tu nombor uno so that that means to me uh, hospital tu has managed to establish dia punya namesake lah uh, sebab uh, teaching hospital HUSM is not meant for ni is meant for helping masyarakat. So kita ditubuhkan untuk help masyarakat yang sengaja dilakukan di Kelantan dan tidak ada teaching hospital di IPPT, di Bertam ataupun di Pulau Pinang. Sedang so, mesti kena buat di Kelantan. So um, to help the people uh, to uplift the health of the population in Kelantan lah. So. Okay, there's another question from uh, Prof Rosna Sultan. Sharing courses by multiple universities to create one degree sounds interesting, hmm. but do we need to follow NQA and get approval as usual? No shortcut. The them say ni first you go to go through JPT, okay? You have a new DG now. Tengok new DG tu kata apa? <laughs> NQA is after the the JPT. Ah, don't get me wrong. To follow procedure, yes. Yes, yes. kalau follow procedure bukan yang tunggu MQA. MQA senang je. You nak buat degree ni, JPT setuju dah lagi. Okay. Uh, kalau DPT tak setuju lagi, then you go through the mail lah. Uh, tapi saya rasa sekarang ni, uh, kalau betul uh, prediction that universities now moving towards subscription rather than enrollment, then things better move fast. So I personally will prepare MQA for that because that's what I do now. Uh, flexible education to the field. Uh, like now, uh, apa, uh, skill, skill. You are asking me for medicine, but uh, as President Academy, we have the skill uh, to juggle skill of people in the industry. But the universities are producing the necessary skill too slow. By the time dua tahun dari sekarang lepas JPT, baru sekarang nak cakap orang dalam industri dah move to the next technology. So say, they say they cannot afford this anymore. So we now have technology assemblies. Maknanya set up by the industry for the industry to teach mereka and industry bagi scholarship lagi sebab as soon as you graduate the industry grab. So what does MQA do? MQA sekarang ni akan accredite uh, the courses supaya sekarang ni satu hari those who graduate from the technology assembly it, it can go up to master or PhD dengan technology assembly they can now come in uh, into masters and PhD of IPTA lah. Level master PhD tapi dia tak dapat that degree because the degree is still in the hands of the university. So tang situ kita ada the the trump card lah. But yeah. I'm sure trump card ni tak lama sebab the industry sekarang ni don't know don't care about where you graduate from. Janji you have the skill they will they will yeah. Yeah. So this is something that we need to also address in the future. The value of the degree itself. Uh, so unless we go through change, uh, we're not going to be able to put up the things needed. Okay, there's another question which is uh, quite optimistic. Uh, thank you for the great talk. It's from, uh, I think, from Prof. Razif, uh, Prof. Datu Asma. So, some countries like Korea, uh, business is running as usual and works well. My question is, do we need to invest a lot of money on high-tech teaching, knowing the situation will be back to normal, maybe in six months? <laughs> All day of bedside, bedside teaching will be back as, us as usual. Uh, not as usual, still kena undergo uh, uh, physical distancing, right? Because uh, COVID ni kita tak tahu bila until unless we have a vaccine, which is about two years from now, and even then the vaccine pun kena make sure it's an effective vaccine uh, that will cover and that the vaccine must be made available to all because as I said, any uh, apa, outbreak anywhere is a risk everywhere, right? The COVID has taught you that. So it's not just a Wuhan thingy, it's like everywhere around the world within a short time. So um, there are so many things. So until we have something yang boleh kata, okay, clear from COVID because 76% asymptomatic is very dangerous. Huh? You can be very healthy and you rasa macam you are God uh, and, and uh, you will not be infected, but you are actually transmitting. And that's even a worse crime. So uh, to me, uh, even post COVID, kita dah kena belajar pasal social distancing ataupun I prefer to use physical distancing. Yeah? Uh, so, um, apa, all that need to be in place. 
bila kita dok continue tu kata uh, pasal apa nak buat uh, online sebab um, satu hari kan kita nak go back to website jadi tak perlulah so the next pandemic jadi apa so today the next pandemic happen in 2020 what if the next pandemic happen in december of 2020 what happen now right kalau dari dulu lagi masa saya di DG lagi kita dah kata 20 200 MOOCs that we need to have to share cross platform supaya jangan ada from one university but together together we make this 200 MOOCs available bila berlaku pandemic tak ada masalah dah sekarang learning baru ni and you tengok cara online learning kita is like ambil powerpoint and then mengajar kat student you know so it's like same old same old but how do i know whether learning has occurred or not Because you can't see the face of the student in yeah. your body language, etc. Kalau dalam classroom tu 300 orang, you can't see. Macam sekarang lah ada 300 lebih kata dalam dalam I'm talk. I can't see. I don't even know what you guys are thinking about what my talk unless you write something in the chat. But but other than that, uh, it's kind of difficult to see body language. I mean, in the class you can see, you know. But uh, online is the way forward now. So I don't think we can go back. So better lah, you know. Uh, to be prepared to do online uh, le- teaching and itu sebelum wahyu turun ha? bila wahyu turun kata promotion now based on online punya courses ha? habis cerita masa tu um, you know and yes. not, there's nothing stopping you say untuk medical school I want to see at least one uh, as part of your SKT boleh je that way you kena that way baru you know dalam dan what i'm trying to say kadang-kadang online learning ni macam pm tepi tau ada setengah-setengah guru aja dok buat yang lain-lain semua don't know don't care as i say so sekarang ni how you going to enhance ah uh, the because yang senior tu dalam kepala depa have all this knowledge my god kena correct this knowledge and and put it uh, down into some online that's why saya kata kat USM kalau boleh the senior work together dengan junior. Ha, senior ni memang mampu keras dah nak so use technology ni buat dah keras dah. <laughs> so so may, maybe we should work with the young one because you don't know. But the young one lacks the skill and experience which is now, you know, experience come with years. Um, so if we can have uh, they can uh, put the team together and create uh, apa interactive fantastic online learning and you can measure that online learning how many students around the world are actually now are uh, seeing uh, this particular and learning from it that would be a new challenge lah saya rasa in the future for connect kan pangkat yeah yeah true i have uh, there's another one uh, question uh, before we teach medical students how to communicate well the academic fraternity themselves need to revisit how to communicate better among themselves <laughs> kan saya dah cakap dah ha, itu yang tu yang sebenarnya itu yang sebenarnya kita kena belajar untuk communicate 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 right and um, saya rasa sekarang ni kan this uh, covid-19 dan dengan zoom ni ya Allah i have now more meetings in a day than i probably have before and yeah. now notice that dah tak kira Eh, yang ni ni habis kerja pukul enam setengah ke tak? Rasa nak mereka nak buat Zoom, mereka buat Zoom, you know? So, and and the student lah ni, seronok mereka tulis. Mereka seronok lah ni because the lecturer tak boleh lari. Dia dah kata book Zoom time ni. Masa ni, memang dia akan dapat the lecturer. You know, kalau tidak lecturer entah ke mana lah, meeting lah, ISO lah, apa lah. So now, the student are getting accessibility mono a mono dengan the lecturer bila lagi dia dapat benda macam ni uh, and and we save a lot of time now we don't have to travel uh, we don't have to dress up we don't have to ni just look decent up here saja ya. cukup lah <laughs> laki laki apa i don't know what happen just oh, i cannot stand this all this meeting dengan beard dengan cukok dengan dengan long hair ya. something has got to go but apa uh, <laughs> <laughs> but other than that it was a lot of fun to see and meet uh, people at the same time meetings now betul lah dr raja now is better ah uh, kan uh, dengan betul, betul betul more busier than before ah uh, more busier than before and notice dah boleh pula kita tak payah print all the uh, minit mesyuarat kita semua pakai online aja because all you have to do is get that slide person to share the the minutes of the mesyuarat that's it kita just pay attention to that so there's a lot of sustainability saving the trees from being cut down you know so and then you notice dah walaupun kita buat macam ni 
Ah uh, dekat Pulau Pinang ni Sungai Pinang dah yang hitam tu dah jadi comel balik dah because no pollution. So there are something good about COVID that we are say ah kata I panggil tu hikmah lah hikmah hikmah that we see. So those positive things I think uh, are the new norm that we should now abide by and there are some renewed norm yeah that we should uh, go back to. Those are reminders yeah. Yes. Yeah, there, there is one more. I think one fi- one question. I mean, I thought uh, apa ni, uh, Prof Dekan nak ask some question here. You have something to say? Or no, I think I'm... it's a good question from Prof Saifu there. Eh? Uh, uh, yeah. uh-huh. I was going to read that one. Can Academic Science Malaysia advise the politicians <laughs> so that the relevant ministries can work together more seriously? None should be superior than the other. Aha, that's what you think I'm doing. That's what we have been doing. Um, apa, um, we meet often and I think uh, Academy Nani kita punya minister is KJ. And KJ is very apa, energetic dan dia memang uh, Nani mulut dia sprout science saja. So Alhamdulillah, so, but he's active enough to want to know, to want to listen and then lepas tu to Call, uh, call for this meeting. Sebab sekarang ni kita memang call for a lot of meetings now. And the beauty of it is not just about the politician. It's about the fact that Academy of Science now is being asked to do a lot of roadmaps. Uh, uh, move uh, things in the future uh, by 10-10 to, for science to move economy, for for composite, for uh, apa, a lot of uh, health uh, So that's what we are now doing to apa uh, provide uh, the roadmap and the, the, the we are thought leaders so we are not doers so we have to provide just the thinking about how this is going to go on. But alhamdulillah lah, we are we are now getting our foothold and uh, inshallah uh, working together. Daripada awal lagi that's what we had uh, requested uh, and and uh, I'm glad that KJ initiate for the MOH Mosti MOHE. Sebab uh, dia, kita ni uh, uh, pensyarah duduk di MOHE. So unless MOHE come to the game, uh, it's difficult for us. But all of us want to help. We know we want to help. Like, no way you can get 16,000 diagnostic without having all the labs dalam uh, universities to now work together. Tambah pula molecular lab. Hello? We need to do RT-PCR. It's not about uh, some regular uh, apa, diagnostic test that we're supposed to do. So That is what I mean by apa, I managed to get uh, apa, UMS, uh, Institute of Biotech, which is supposed to do R&D, tapi mereka dapat uh, turn around, Alhamdulillah, uh, turn around to apa, be, uh, and repurpose the lab for diagnostic. Because this is a time, Sabah kan tak cukup, eh? so they, they need uh, many uh, hospital and the research facilities. Technique. So how to train them? So we had the medical team dekat HUSM and dekat uh, Inform, to now help uh, the uh, apa, Institute of Biotech di UMS to now be able to set up the lab ready for diagnostic macam mana nak guna PPE, macam mana all those things sekarang ni uh, this is what help is all about so WhatsApp group is now being set up to to to, to help lah during the pandemic so to me, we come to the point tak kisahlah you minister mana tapi bila anybody needs help, we form the whatsapp group and we help immediately because question yang nak, reagent ni boleh guna tak? yang ni boleh guna tak? Is, ini is immediate ni, bukan yang nak kena pergi meeting baru nak cerita, so some things I think, um, you know uh, needs to be done uh, as part and parcel of helping yeah, yeah there's one question from uh, I think uh, Dr. Muhammad Numan I think Numan Uh, what's your opinion for simulation substituting clinical teaching? Looking no, at I, I dah kata dah it, it, is, it is technology is there. Uh, we are moving to that, but it's no substitute. It complements uh, teaching. So saya masih pegang pada that lah. Unless you can convince me differently. Memang simulation makin lama makin canggih dah. The anatomy, my simulation, uh, all that. Is there? I think kebanyakan medical school pun dah buat dah. Tapi at the end of the day, you still need to do that uh, last bit. A simulation, I think, is necessary for you to get the skill because um, you know uh, you can dapat markah and the and the lecturer can see how many times you cut the vein and and what not, you know, and make the patient bleed. But uh, and and but at the end of the day, you pass that clinical simulation, then finally you still have to go to the patient uh, and see that in reality. 
Saya uh, ada satu soalan Datuk Wan. Oh ya, okey okey. Ah, uh, terima kasih uh, thank you uh, Datuk Asma. I'm interested in the um, renew new revenue for the medical school. <laughs> okay. In terms of uh, next flix of medical education. Yeah. So how on earth do you think IPTA combined with IPTS of different number of placement different fees that share the netflix of education you get your share i got my share then we can attract huge global international student to join us without being present within 5 years maybe have to be present for one year only for example so how the akta so and so ipta and ipts i think it's a really okay. difficult what's the solution Dani, we are blur now. The line between IPTA and IPTS is now blurred. IPTA dulu is meant education for public good. Now IPTA pun dok charge. Bukan yang murah pula tu. Dok charge mahal juga. So now the IPTS memang dia pun meant to apa uh, generate income. So now kita ni dah mula encroach into when we start to become a hybrid. We are now uh, encroaching into the world of the IPTS and And when we start to move to the world IPTS, so that's why dulu kita form uh, itu example. Right now you tanya ke I, I pun tak boleh nak kata off the cuff. But if now I form that 200 MOOCs kata for medicine yang ada contribution by the different ni kan. So all this is now a consortium that put together all these thing into what we call the Netflix of medical education. And now you can subscribe. So when you subscribe, the subscription fee is now divided. And uh, you know, and once we start to go online, the more viewers you get, of course, there are advertisement, and that advertisement is what gives you the money uh, to go forward. So there, there are many things lah that can happen. Tapi kita kena work in a consortium. Uh, baru banyak. Sebab kalau tunggu UKM saja, berapa aja you boleh produce? Kalau tunggu USM, berapa aja? Tapi together, together, berapa total uh, medical kita lah tiga puluh something kan? IPTA dengan IPTS. IPTA saja tiga belas. Seperti itu. Ah, 32 kau. So 32 kata garanti 5 per per institution 32 times 5 dah berapa dah? Katalah in one year you guarantee you akan produce 5 MOOCs ka, 5 micro credentials ka, 5 apa ka. You know, so when I was uh, attending the govern apa Commonwealth punya meeting ah uh, um, because I'm now board governor of Commonwealth learning. So when I attended that, I find that the medical schools in Sri Lanka, in um, in India, they are all giving a medical uh, degree online learning. I pun terkejut. I kata, no way. Uh, I dah mula sangsi lah doktor-doktor yang sangsakan. I said, did you manage to get professional body in your country to agree to this? They kata, yes, the professional body agreed to this. 100% online. Are you sure it's 100% online? They, they mentioned it's online majority but they still have to go to the as part of the consortium uh, katalah saya daripada Kerala saya kena pi to the institution in Kerala tu uh, and get uh, to do the apa the actual patient tu tapi sikit jelah so that's why instead of up to 70% online they probably go up to 90% online or 95% online 5% to still they buat tapi dia tak payah mai to the university They can do it in the centers that the university co op as their partners. You know, uh, I think case in point, Minerva University. If you study the concept of Minerva University set up by Harvard and, and, and MIT and Stanford, you, you, you begin to see that is the concept. Nobody owns a university. You just need a coordinator like Bukhari, uh, Project Bukhari tu. Bukhari, that's it. I don't know, nasi Bukhari tu. So, uh, uh, you, you just have to uh, with a with a manager that manages all this so the 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 apa the the if you subscribe to this netflix on medical education you can get an asma to talk you can get raja afandi to talk you, you don't have to be in a university i dah cakap dah you uh, masa idg lagi tiga university in fact i challenge emran i challenge emran to have now a phd emran bukan phd um usm PhD Emran, budak ni akan rotate to all the Emran to finish dia punya PhD. Um, yang R&D dia, teknologi dia, dia pergi rotate lima. So dia dia akan graduate from Emran, bukan dia graduate from any one university. So whatever benefit dia, dia, dia dapat daripada UKM, dia will be enriched. They go to USM, enriched. 
Can you imagine that? So why not uh, kita buat? Uh, saya challenge kan masa USM saya kata business school can do this very fast. Kenapa business school kena together? So why not three or four? We have Glasgow, we have Bangkok, we have ni. Supaya budak from manage, tomorrow is about international business. So they don't have to ni, but they have now lecturers from Hong Kong, from ni, all together teaching them. Can enrich the punya kepala otak ni. So I think break down lah this silo thingy thinking, you know. Uh, and then there is already the apa uh, Dekan Council IPTA. There's also a Dekan Medical Council IPTS. Why not you guys come together and 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 talk about it? And because tomorrow is about subscription, it's no longer about enrollment. So and then to get a degree, you tambah lagi PT and you get uh, a degree. Sama lah macam edX apa semua kan. You kena tambah. And then you can get degree. So um, as I said, PhD M run sampai hari ni tak jadi jadi lagi. Because we are still competing, we should work together and compete outside. Tapi we are still ini lah masalahnya. Bila kita nak bekerjasama, we have this ranking game, right? This ranking game put us back to oh good lord. Ah uh, berapa kita hari ni? Ah uh, UKM 160, USL 165. Ah oh, ni tak ada game ni kena kena compete balik. Eh. You know, and then UM, oh my god, UM still, you know, going higher and higher. So, inilah macam mana nak work together, kan? So, kalau, that's why saya kata, break down this, uh, saya dah kata dah, we need to go to impact, not to QS ranking, tapi time higher education, impact ranking against SDG. Barulah kita meaningful impact pada masyarakat. Uh, so, ini usrah aku petang ni lah. So, apa? Uh, uh, the same can be done. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and you know the the if you get more volume, you don't have to pay a hell of a lot. So a lot of people will subscribe to you now. And uh, why why only to get a degree? Because maybe orang macam I not tahu knowledge. Meningkat kan we bawa ke we masing kan? Macam COVID ni, I want to know more of it. Or certain technology, I want to know skill. I mean. Azlan hari tu bawa I tengok apa you all punya clinical skill lab kan yang hebat tu right where you get Siemens and what not to contribute right so that is by itself there tapi soalnya itu still kena learn tapi in terms of technology in terms of knowledge I can also subscribe to you for that and why should I subscribe to one university when when I can go to a consortium and I can get everybody punya hebat you know uh, I think we finish at half past four ya yeah? Dato' Azman okay Ah, I'm okay. I tak masak kan? I kata. No <laughs> Nasi Bukhari akan diserve empat setengah. <laughs> okay, uh, one question from anonymous attendee. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Uh, what do you think on live streaming, especially clinic sessions for medical students to join during this pandemic to get the real live cases? Kan saya dah kata, virtual cases ke live cases ke, this is something that uh, we can uh, actually do. Tapi kan, selagi dia tak touch patient, selagi tu dia punya skill is not yet complete. Yes. Right? Sebab uh, virtual reality, uh, simulation, dia boleh tengok how to do melalui live. Then dia still kena buat this simulation until they practice and practice and practice and get it right. Lepas tu at the end of the day, they still have to touch the patient. So tak tahulah ke, ke mungkin ada seniors dalam medical ni yang lebih afdal yang kata tak perlu. Tapi my reading has shown that uh, dalam semua because to prepare, ada kata dekat Wan Zorina berserabut kepala I to prepare. So, right? so uh, to prepare, I had to read quite a lot. And and a lot of the uh, physicians uh, around the world, uh, when they discuss about post-COVID or during COVID, uh, what is going to happen uh, to medical education, rata-rata uh, um, uh, kata uh, teknologi cannot uh, apa, replace. Uh, the way forward has to be blended uh, learning uh, and this is where this is where ka uh, raja uh, that uh, apa kalau kita nak they have to come in and waktu they come in tu kita charge them for ni ataupun partner kita dekat Kerala kita bagi a certain percentage untuk dia pergi buat dia punya lab kat sana and then each one of us also get uh, apa a percentage of that card so I think we need to move forward in terms of thinking. It's no longer about UKM or USM or UPM. It's about a consortium thinking uh, in the future. If we don't do it, somebody else will. And, yeah. and we will be left behind again, you know? 
the message about uh, breaking down silos too is very much uh, you know uh, talked about during this uh, session. Hmm. And I think it ties with uh, Prof. Dato Hanafi. Actually, I'll just read his comment. Yeah? Uh, his, he just put in chat. Thank you very much for the most insightful session. We enjoyed it very much. Agree with Prof. Dato Asma. We need to break the silos. I look forward to a more collaborative future, not just with the faculty, but also with other universities. Ah, so that's yes. from him. Uh, I've got one final question from me, actually. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, it's going to affect research quite a bit, you know, especially research involving humans. Um, how creative, you know, like when you want to get uh, do clinical trials, for instance, you have to recruit uh, subjects and all that. So um, that sort of has to come up with quite a creativity in terms of trying to get uh, subjects who are COVID uh, negative, you know. Okay. So how how what else do you think you you we can do in order to, to overcome this? Yeah, I, I think the same uh, is now happening dengan the clinical trial for the vaccine yang Oxford dah buat tu. Ah yes, yeah. Uh, so kan they kena screen kan uh, semua orang before they start to do all. So the... that will involve screening. Yeah, that will be additional cost that we have to take into but, account. But that is now going to be part and parcel of uh, this lah because there is no at the moment there is no herd immunity. Uh, ah, so there's so if you have antibody, that means you have been exposed, but it doesn't mean that right. you are protected, right? So right. so yes. you have been exposed, lah. So you can now be tested because your your clinical trial is based on something else, right? Ah, to get a clean person now, mungkin rather difficult, lah. Difficult, yes, yes, yes. That's something that we have to think about, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that comes to that brings us to the end of the webinar. Thank you so much, Prof. Dato Asma, for the very uh, interesting session. And uh, maybe uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Fendi would like to say a few words in closing. The session. Uh, terima kasih, Dato Wan Zurina dan uh, Dato Asma. It's a pleasure to listen all these uh, new ideas, new challenge, challenge to all the medical deans and Pengarah Hospital how we can work together, uh, sound like consortium, Netflix of medical education, new revenues, co-creation, new KPI for Pensyarah, I'm sure that will also be Yeah, so for example, I have to have one online teaching, how many global international students, I have to get three in order to progress. Maybe that will, uh, very, uh, it could be scary for those who don't like the change, but the only constant is change. If you don't change, we will be changed or I will be changed. Yes, so I think, uh, and also in the recent uh, 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 news, uh, the, the only university maybe survive in the top 50 university because they have very solid digital platform. Mm -hmm. So uh, university, uh, let's say from 100 to 1000, they are struggling. They really have to form consortium mm -hmm. for any form of education. Otherwise, they are really lagging behind. As Adato Asma mentioned there, we really have to re-strategize in many aspects of mm -hmm. our education, clinical services, and so on and so. So I think uh, uh, I don't have Nasib Bukhari here to give to you, but uh, next time we we'll come to KL, we bring it to Nasib Bukhari. And again, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, okay. This series yang pertama, Fakulti Perubatan UKM buat, uh, 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 dan akan ada lagi siri yang berikutnya, kita akan mengajak Dekan-dekan yang terdahulu, pengarah-pengarah hospital di seluruh uh, hospital pengajar untuk bersama memikirkan uh, bicara, tinta hmm. ataupun pandangan 50 tahun ke datang. Macam hmm. mana idea yang telah dikatakan oleh Dato' Asma tadi, dikapitalize. Macam uh, Malaysia Research University Network. I surprised tak ada program yang buat. Contohnya PhD contohnya. Dah patutnya dah start kan Dato' Asma? Hmm. Yeah. So I think... Uh, we take this challenge and Prof Saiful here as well, uh, uh, President or Dean Council. Dan saya rasa itu saja uh, untuk semua, kita uh, empat setengah. Uh, again, saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada semua yang terlibat, Cik Bukhari, uh, Tuan Jidin, dan rakan-rakan pengurusan, uh, Datuk Wan Zurina dan Prof Asma dan rakan-rakan pengurusan dan Datuk Anna Fiaf pengarah uh, hospital pengajar kita dan di luar sana. Semoga kita uh, bernekat uh, would change, would be more innovative and creative mm. dalam masa post-COVID nanti 
yang kita tak tahu bilanya berlaku real post covid. So itu saja dari saya dan sekian saja. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Dan salam sejahtera. Waalaikumsalam. Ya. Okey. Okey untuk Okey, thank you. Thank you Asman. Eh sama Hera dan Raya. Raya. Dan new norm tak ingat Raya dah. Tak masak. Tak masak. Tahun ni I'm so lucky tak payah bagi duit raya sebab no nephews or nieces are coming. Tapi kita kena itu kita ha? kena berinovatif duit raya online. Tahu. Ibu dah minta ada duit raya online. <laughs> okay, assalamualaikum. Okay, assalamualaikum. Salam. Okay, bye. Terima kasih.